Chapter 13, February 17th, 1863 If I had a cow that gave such milk, I'd clothe her in the finest silk, I'd feed her on the choicest hay, and milk her forty times a day. Ha ha ha, you and me, little brown jug, how I love thee. Ha ha ha, you and me, little brown jug, how I love thee. Couple skipped to this lively polka played by the Kentucky Militia Band. Candles glowed from chandeliers. Servants passed goblets of wine and punch to the guests, and in a side room, beautiful tables were heaped with sandwiches, pastries, and fruit. The gala at the State House was a glittering event. All Louisville society was there. Most of the young men wore blue dress uniforms of the Union Army. The older ones looked dignified in frock coats and ruffled shirts. But it was the women who added color and elegance in their fine hoop skirts, elbow-length gloves, and gleaming jewels, with fans and dance cards dangling at their wrists. From the festival look of things, it was hard to tell that Kentucky was in the middle of a grim war. At that very moment, rebel forces under General John Morgan were carrying out guerrilla raids, and there was skirmishing near Louisville, but none of it seemed to bother the party-goers. Two debutantes, perched on gilded chairs, were sipping punch and eyeing a slender young man who wandered about by himself. Unlike the others, Mr. Mayberry wasn't in uniform. His suit, well cut and expensive, fit perfectly. He had blue eyes, dark wavy hair, and a neat mustache, and moved with ease and confidence. The girls discussed him in whispers. Mr. Mayberry was a bit of a mystery. Nobody knew much about him. One rumor had it that he was the heir of a wealthy Boston family who had been disowned for having Confederate sympathies. Another claimed the opposite. He was from a large Georgia plantation and had to leave home because he favored the Union cause. Neither story was correct. The mysterious Mr. Mayberry was actually Emma on a new assignment, wearing another of her many faces. Back at the Union camp, General Hooker's aide had explained the situation. When the war began, three states, Maryland, Missouri, and Kentucky, were known as border states. Though they were slave-holding areas, they formed a kind of buffer zone between the North and the South. People in Kentucky were about evenly divided. They supported slavery, but didn't want to secede and destroy the Union. It was a dilemma, and Kentucky tried to solve it by staying neutral. Then in August of 1862, General Kirby Smith invaded the state with a rebel army. Washington answered by sending General Ulysses Grant and his troops to occupy the key town of Paducah. With war on its doorsteps, neutrality for Kentucky was impossible, and the state finally went over to the Union side. But wars aren't fought only on battlefields. Louisville became a center of undercover activity. Because of the divided feelings, there were many Southern sympathizers, as well as agents who fed valuable data to the rebel leaders in Richmond. General Hooker wanted to stop all these leaks, and once again, Franklin Thompson was called in. This time, the aide said to Pi Private Thompson, you'll work as a detective, not a spy. You won't be operating behind enemy lines, but in our own territory among friends. The major tapped a street plan of Louisville on the map board. This town is crawling with informers. Somehow the rebels know every blasted move we make. We know their main agent is feeding them facts every day. He's brilliant and very cagey. Your job, Thompson, is to find out who the devil he is. The officer scribbled a name and an address on a slip of paper and passed it to Thompson. This is your contact in Louisville. He'll supply you with funds, clothes, and so on. We can't use him for this job because he's too well known there. What we need is a total stranger, a man with brains and backbone. He stood up and held out his hand. Keep your wits about you, Thompson. Get to know the pro-Southerners in Louisville. Take plenty of time. Keep your eyes open and don't get shot. Franklin tackled the new job with confidence. In Louisville, he met his secret contact, creating the new identity of Charles Mayberry. Then he rented a room in a boarding house run by a woman said to have rebel sympathies. This had advantages for Mayberry. It tagged him as a possible Confederate supporter and gave him a chance to listen in on the other borders. Through his contact, he began to meet the city's important people and gradually to build an image. 
He played his role carefully, tactfully, and by the time of the gala dance, Mr. Mayberry had gained a toehold in Louisville society. By then, he also had a fairly good idea of the city's pro-Southern groups. But sympathy and political opinions didn't add up to treason. The chief Confederate agent, the man Mayberry was after, remained a total mystery. At the State House dance, Charles strolled about in his fine suit, bowing graciously to his acquaintances. Now and then he casually stroked his mustache, pressing it gently to make sure the spirit gum would keep it in place. Later he went into the refreshment room and helped himself to a sandwich. Nearby, at the end of the long table, he spotted P. N. Aylesworth, a short round man with auburn mutton chop whiskers and fat ready cheeks. Aylesworth, said to be very pro-reb, didn't know it, but he was part of Mayberry's developing plan. Enjoying the party, Mayberry? Indeed, I am, sir, Charles replied, remembering to keep his voice in a low key, especially the food. He gulped his sandwich hungrily and reached for another. Out of the corner of his eye he saw Aylesworth watching and could guess what he was thinking. These young blades, easy come, easy go, no idea how to handle their money. Look at him, half starved. Mr. Aylesworth, Charles said between mouthfuls, I have a bit of a problem. I wondered, sir, if I could stop by to see you tomorrow. The fat man smiled. Sure, Mayberry, come round to the office first thing in the morning. We'll talk then. Aylesworth was a wealthy dry goods merchant with a large, busy shop in Louisville. He had contacts to supply Union regiments with blankets and uniforms. Early the following morning, Mr. Mayberry visited the shop and was directed to the owner's office and back. Aylesworth greeted him, then lit a cigar and leaned back at his roll-top desk. Pretending embarrassment, Mayberry said, Sir, I find myself a bit short of funds and needful of employment. I write a very fine hand and am good with sums. I uh, thought just possibly there might be some opening for me here. Aylesworth, his eyes keen, questioned the young man in detail about his background and opinions. To play safe, May Mayberry mixed truth with fiction. He told Aylesworth he was born in Canada on a large, prosperous farm. After his education, he came to America to make his way. He worked in various cities as a salesman and now, winding up in Louisville, was out of funds and in need of a job. He also let slip a hint that his war sympathies was very much with the South. The merchant squinted and scratched his chin. It just so happened that his old bookkeeper was leaving and had to be replaced, as Mayberry already knew. At last, Aylesworth nodded. I'll give you a chance, Mayberry, but mind you, it's only a trial. If you want to stay here, you'll have to prove yourself. Mayberry thanked him gratefully and began to learn his new duties. For the next week, the young man worked very hard, always first at his desk in the morning and last to leave at night. The company's bills and ledgers were in a mess, and he was able to bring order out of the chaos, which pleased his busy employer. Aylesworth was so impressed with Mayberry that he even allowed him to handle an important sale, a big consignment of blankets, to a nearby army post. Riding on the wagon next to the driver, Mayberry worried that someone at the Union camp would recognize him and, get, and give the game away, but he needn't have fretted. With his fine mustache, dark civilian suit, and round bowler hat, he had no trouble passing. He left the shipment at the quartermaster depot, arranged for payments and receipts, then returned to Louisville. After this success, Aylesworth began to rely heavily on him. He had a free run of the shop and stock rooms as well as the account books. Watching the people come and go, Charles also learned what he'd suspected. Aylesworth and Company was a clearinghouse for undercover rebel activities. He still couldn't put his finger on any hard evidence, but felt he was on the right track. Aylesworth had one special friend, a tall, lanky, sour-looking man named Hall. He and the merchant had secret dealings. They would often closet themselves in the office with the door carefully closed and locked. Mayberry was anxious to eavesdrop on these meetings, but knew it would be too risky to try. Meanwhile, time was passing. At night, lying awake on the lumpy boarding house bed, Emma plagued herself with questions. Who was this gloomy Mr. Hall? Was he the man she was after? 
How could she find out? Where would she get the evidence she needed? Emma liked to make decisions and act on them. She hated the idea of personal failure, but she couldn't seem to break through the shell of secrecy. Another frustrating week went by with no results. Then she came up with a wild plan. It was unusual, daring and dangerous, but it just might bring matters to a head. It might also, if something went wrong, cost Charles Mayberry his life.